Okay. Hello everyone, I'm Luigi Leonardi. I'm a PhD student in computer engineering at the University of Pisa. And uh, along with Professor Giuseppe Lettieri and uh, Dr. Giacomo Pellicci, we developed a framework that we called eBPF based extensible paravirtualization. So this is the outline of the today's presentation. I will start with a few words on para paravirtualization, but I'm sure that you all know paravirtualization better than I do. Then I'll move on with uh, some words on eBPF. So what, what, is that, what is this technology? Then we will see what uh, HyperApp calls are. Then we will mo move on with uh, our framework, eBPF based access extensible paravirtualization. And then we will see some um, a use case of, uh, of, our, of our framework with, with some results. Then we will, will be time for, uh, for, for Q&A. So le let's begin. I guess uh, you, all know, you all know paravirtualization, so uh, it is just a quick look on uh, how paravirtualization para can be achieved. So there are uh, some several techniques with uh, each uh, and each of them has its own pros and cons. So the, the most important one are hypercalls that are much like system calls, but for, uh, for the hypervisor. So uh, the, main the main advantage is that we can almost do anything with, with hypercalls, but, but on the other hand, we have to modify the, the kernel. One, uh, one interest, one, some, something to take, to take into consideration is that the guest operating system is, is, knows that it's being virtualized. This is not an issue, but it's something to, to take into, into consideration. Also, they are, uh, they are quite expensive because we have a context switch from the uh, guest operating system to the, to the hypervisor. Another technique is VM introspection. So, of course, the, the hypervisor has full access to the virtual machine memory. And um, so it, it can access all, uh, all the data structures. Uh, so with this technique, we do not need to modify the, the kernel, of course. The, kernel, the, guest, the guest kernel does, know, does not know that it is being virtualized. But uh, on the other hand, techniques like KSLR, so kernel address KSLR authorization or confidential computing, defeats this, this approach because the memory is simply underst not understandable. Another technique that we will see in a moment is uh, hyperup calls. That is similar to VM introspection, actually. So what is eBPF? Well, eBPF started as a, BPF stands for Berkeley Packet Filter, so it started as a packet filter uh, many years ago. Now it is being extended, E stands for extended actually. And right now it is a flexible and efficient technology. It is composed of an instruction set, storage ob objects, and helper functions. This is a quite, um, quite useful, useful debugging tool because it enables dynamic tracing, so we are able to insert tracing points into live software with almost zero overhead. And the uh, interesting, interesting thing, things is that, is, the thing is that it is supported in uh, mainline Linux. As I said, um, eBPF has its own instruction set. It is a reduced instruction set, actually. And for this reason, it can be formally verified. So we can, we can verify all the code that is being executed. And the kernel, of course, supports this, this thing. So kernel is not modified, as I said, because it is supported in, in Linux. So what is a, a, a possible approach to eBPF? Well, eBPF code is written in a C, C, C style, C like language, and then is then compiled into bytecode using, for instance, Clang. Clang supports uh, eBPF. Of course, we have a just in time compiler inside, inside the Linux kernel, or we have an interpreter. It works on every, almost every architecture. So once the bytecode has been generated, it can be presented to the kernel, ready to be, ready to be ver ver verified. So uh, this step is, this is quite important because we are injecting something inside the kernel. So we, we, we must be sure that uh, this, does, this, not, this not, does not do any harm to, to the operating system. So if the verification is successful, this code is then, is then loaded, loaded inside the kernel. And then we can collect the back information, statistics, and so on, as we will see in a, in a, in a few minutes using the BPF map. So what are hyperup calls? Well. As I said, with VM introspection, we have full access to the virtual machine memory. But the hypervisor doesn't really know where, that, where data structures are located and how to access them because of different kernel versions and so on. So the idea here is that the guest sends a message to the, to the hypervisor registering with these cyber calls. And, but what does this message contain? Well, they contain two information. The first one is some code, and the second one are references. This code is... Uh, is, is, is a code to, that, that uh, access, in order to access data, data structures. So 
we are telling the hypervisor how to manage this, these data structures. Of course, we have a security issue because we are sending some code to the hypervisor to be executed. So we need to, to verify it. So we are using, uh, they are using eBPF even, even here. And one, if the verification is successful, the registration is completed and uh, everything, uh, everything works. So the hypervisor, when he wants to know uh, something about, the, about the, the guest operating system, can invoke this, this hyperapp call. There is no context switch between the guests and the, the host, so it is very fast. Code is verified, but uh, as I said before, this does not work where, when we are in a confidential computing environment. So moving on to our, uh, our system. So uh, our, uh, the idea that we, that we implemented is that the host send, is sending a message to the, to the guest. We have a guest agent that receives this, these messages and consumes accordingly, uh, according to, to some information inside the message. We have, a, we have another. As you may have guessed, the, the message contains some eBPF code. You are injecting eBPF code inside, inside the guest. So uh, as the hypervisor, we use QEMO that you, may, that you may know, I guess, and um, using a, a virtual device. We have a, because we have a virtual device, we also developed a device driver. It is a simple, uh, simple kernel module. So as a module, it can be loaded or unloaded at any time. eBPF code can be loaded or unloaded at any time. So we do not need to modify the guest kernel at all. One interesting aspect is that the, the, the guest is free to decide to load the eBPF program or not. What does this mean? Well, the guest agent, when, when it receives the, the message, it receives the eBPF, eBPF ELF file, it can, it can analyze it. So it can see what, what, is, what, it, will, what it, it will do. For instance, it can contain a k-probe, and uh, with a k-probe, you have to specify which function will be, will be probed. And you, you can have a list of allowed, uh, of the, of allowed functions. So we can implement some policy. We, we do not need to implement any of them, but for the sake of simplicity, but it can be, it can be, it can be done. And so the guest is also, has also the, the, this possibility to enforce some, some policy. So how, how does our system compare with, uh, with relation to hyperapp calls? Well, we are both sending messages, but in our case, we are sending a message from the host to the guest, while in, uh, in hyperapp calls, we have, we are doing, they are doing the other way around. So it's, it's the guest sending, sending something to the host. We are both using eBPF, uh, maybe for, their, uh, for, for the verifiability uh, property of, of, this, uh, of this technology. And um, one interesting aspect are our response time. So in hyperapp calls, everything is performed by the hypervisor, so there is no context switch between hypervisor and, and guest. This is quite, quite fast. In our system, and uh, this means that we, no, we do not need the help of the, of the guest operating system, so maybe it's busy doing something else. So. This is quite fast. In our system, on the other hand, we need the help of the guest operating system. So we have uh, eBPF code running inside the guest. So we have a context switch because we need to pass information from the guest to the host. And so the response is, is asynchronous, let's say asynchronous. So let's see a use case of our uh, technology. Virtual to physical CPU affinity. You can ask yourself why. Well. <laughs> The reason is speed. We all want to, uh, our application to, to perform as fast as possible. Um, and then you can ask, why don't you, why don't you achieve uh, CPU affinity with uh, static allocation? Of course, you can, but this is not flexible. Uh, in this way, the pinning is performed on, on the fly. So you just pin when, when you need it, and when it's not needed anymore, it can be unloaded. As I said, the BPF code is, uh, can be loaded or unloaded at, at, at any time. Last but not least is security. Maybe you want to, to perform some pinning for security reasons. So. so what is the issue here? Well, what we want to achieve is the image on the right. So we have a guest thread that required to be pinned to vCPU zero. V of course stands for virtual and P stands for, for physical. And we want the CPU to be pinned, vCPU to be pinned on any of the available CPU. For instance, the vCPU zero. But what, what actually happens is the image on the left. So we have a guest thread that is pinned to vCPU zero, but a vCPU inside the, the host system is just a, a process. So it can be scheduled on, on, on any of the available CPUs because nobody told the, the host to perform this, this binding. So this is the semantic gap. So how can we overcome this issue uh, with our, uh, with our um, framework? Well, the host sends a message to the, to the guest using the technique I explained before. 
that, uh, with some eBPF code that contains a k-probe on the scared set affinity function, that is the function invoked uh, when the system call is, is fired. So uh, here, so every time uh, this, 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 this function is called, the, our eBPF code will run, so it, it means that someone invoked the, the system call, so someone wants to be pinned to a, to a specific CPU. Our eBPF code will run, and uh, it will write inside an eBPF map that is, a, that, that is a specific data structure that can be accessed both by user space and by uh, the, the k-prop, so in uh, kernel space. Um, so it writes, it, it writes in inside this eBPF map, and then we have a guest agent that is constantly checking for any changes in this eBPF map. If any change is found, then if this information is sent back to the hypervisor, who can, who can then um, do some <laughs> do something according to some, uh, to some internal policies. I mean, it can do anything, it can do uh, binding, it can do, it can do whatever, whatever it wants. Uh, how can, can they communicate? Well, they can use simply the IO CTL system call. So uh, this is, um, we, we then perform, performed some experiments. So we have a single producer, single consumer uh, lockless queue. So we have a producer and a consumer that are sending messages to, to each other. And we measured the, the throughput in a million packets per second. That's on the, on the y-axis. Starting from the image on, on the left, we have two bars. Uh, on the, the red bar represents the throughput when the vCPU pinning is, is off, is disabled, and the green bar when the, when the vCPU pinning is enabled. Uh, we have two sets of bars because we are, uh, we are considering a low, no load scenario and a low load scenario. Uh, as a load, we use the DS, DS application, with, whose output was redirected to the, to the null, so it is a CPU-bound um, application. So, uh, as you can see, when, uh, when there is no load on the system, there is no noticeable difference between using vCPU pinning or not using it. So this is something we, we actually expected. So, in a low load scenario, we, we, there is some difference. Why? Well, the, we have some load on the system, and the, the Linux scheduler, what it tries to do, is to balance the, the load all among, among all, all available cores. So for this reason, the, the application is moved to, from, one, from one core to the other, losing caches information, and, and thus reducing the overall, overall throughput. This is called uh, CPU hopping. While with uh, vCPU pinning in place, this simply cannot happen because the this scheduler is not allowed to move the, the process from one, one CPU to the other. So mo moving to the image on, on the right, here we are uh, in a in a high load scenario, and uh, we are considering a different, a different issue, the serialization, the serialization issue. As I said, we are working on a lockless queue, so we have uh, both producer and both consumer um, that wants to write many things uh, as possible. And if they are scheduled on the same core and nobody, pre nobody prevents this from happening as without vCPU pinning in place, they are competing for the same, for the same, for the same resource. So it reduces the, the throughput because one has to wait the other to, to complete. So um, going from the left to the right, the, the, the time spent, uh, the, the serialization time spent goes up. So it goes from 0% up to 20%. And as you can see, the, the overall throughput goes down while with um, VCPU pinning in place, so the, the, the green bar, the, the throughput stays quite high. One interesting aspect to, to point out is that in the 0% serialization time, so the, the red bar, the overall throughput is still lower than the, the, the green bar. Why? Well, this is for the same reason as before. So we are in a high load scenario, so this, this process is moved to from one CPU to the other, just like before. So uh, another something, uh, something else we, we consider is uh, the hyperthreading or symmetric multithreading, if you, if you wish. So um, CPU, CPUs are uh, numbered differently, may be numbered different all differently on a virtual machine and on a physical machine. So here we have another semantic gap, because maybe we want to pin uh, two processes, two threads on two different hyperthreads. But what, what, actually, what can happen is that if the, we, we have no remapping, they can be pinned to simply two other, two, two, two different cores. So this is this an anti-gap and a remapping shall be performed. We implemented this, this thing. We performed some, some experience, uh, experiments, just like before. And we considered a no load, low load, and high load scenario. Just like before, the red bar represents where, with, where, um, when hyper-threading uh, 
uh, this view pinning uh, with uh, hypertailing remapping is disabled and the green bar when it is enabled. As you can see in each of the, of the cases, when I'm talking about the two images, two images starting from the left, the overall throughput is higher when the VCP pinning is, is in place. So last but not least, we, we considered, uh, we performed the same experiments on a physical machine and then on a virtual machine with and without VCP pinning in place. So the red bar is, is a physical machine, the green bar uh, virtual machine with a VCP pinning in place, and, uh, and the blue bar is a virtual machine without VCP pinning in place. And as you can see, there is, a, there is no noticeable difference between running on a physical and on a virtual machine in terms of overall throughput, but there is a remarkable difference with, when, uh, without VCP pinning in place, both with uh, load and no load. So <laughs> this means that um, hardware assisted virtualization actually works quite well. So uh, this concludes my presentation. I hope it was uh, all clear. Here you can find my email, my LinkedIn account, and uh, the GitHub page um, of, the, of, the, of this project. Yeah, I actually am the maintainer right now. Thank you. <laughs> if you have any questions, I'm here. I will be happy to answer. So he asked, um, how can, can, we, can we deal with uh, confidential computing and, and eBPF? This is the question it's all about. Well, this is, uh, I, I don't know, <laughs> because um, it, it's, a, it's a very tough question. It is about, all about um, trust. Depends on your, on your system, I guess, because if you, if you how, can I, how can I say? Um, So with eBPF, you can verify your code, so you can, you can be sure that it does not do anything bad. But uh, on the, on, at the same time, you're giving away some confidential information. So it, I think it depends on the application, I guess. I don't know. Thank you. Did you, so the one use case that comes to mind for this is something like with ACPI, when, when the machine starts up, the host can give it API tables including code that is executed. Is that like a, a possible use case for this? Um, because I'm trying to think of when would you want the host to give the get code to execute? And that seems to be one of the main ones. Could you think about API and how it works? So uh, yes, asking whether we consider ACPI as a, a possible use case. No, we did not. This can be an idea. We just consider this use case, but it can be extended to many possible applications. So this can be one of them. It is a, it's a powerful framework, I, I think. Can you speak louder, please? So what about the security implications you are sending the CPF programs? Uh, they generally are the most, uh, uh, most of them are limited to the root user. We are using the root user. So it's asking what, what about privileges? So yes, we are using root privileges. We are probing uh, kernel functions. So yes, we need, we need root privileges, of course. We are, getting, we are getting them from the host. The programs are sent from the host to the guest. So yes, the, of course, it, all, the, all this code must, must be verified. So this is performed by, by the, the kernel before loading them. And as I said, the, the guest agent can also um, 
let me show you the slide. So the, the, the guest agent can also uh, enforce some policies there. So it, it can see, if it sees a k-probe on a specific function, it says, no, I don't want this, this, this to happen. So we have these security measures. We can have also these security measure. Something, 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 something else. So. Uh, yeah, so a one common use case for when you want an eBPF program mm -hmm. is you might uh, collect some data, populate it in a map, and then later you would want to uh, have something user space that reads the map and then does something. Yes. And have you thought about how that use case would apply to what you're doing here? Is there some way that the host can get access to what's been collected in the guest map? I don't, I don't think I understood the question. <laughs> so, so normally with eBPF, you have, uh, you know, you have something in user space, yes. you inject an eBPF program, it may collect data, yes. and then you would later read it out from the maps that have, been, have data. Yeah, sure. But here, it's the host that's injecting an eBPF program into the guest. Mm -hmm. So how would it then later get that data? If it was collected ah, uh, yes, so the, the question is, how can, how can the hypervisor get the, the information back from, from the guest? Um, well, we have the user, user agent that is constantly checking, checking for changes inside this eBPF map, and when he find, finds any changes, it simply uses the IO, IOCTL system call to the uh, virtual device. Okay, but I would, I would probably quite often want to run that on the host, right? Because I might be collecting from, say, multiple VMs or something, rather than just something in, like in this case. Uh, with multiple VMs? I, I don't know. That, that's, that's a tough question. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think uh, we consider just just one one VM. So we, you send this information to the to the virtual device, and uh, and thus it, uh, the hypervisor has this this kind of information. If you have, if you have multiple virtual machines, then you you, you need to uh, understand from which VM is coming from this information. Um, I don't know. It is. I, I have to think about it. This is a possibility, yes. Any other questions? Oh, from the back. How do you deal with maintenance nightmares that you would arise? But please speak louder. Yeah. <laughs> How do you deal with the guest having to have the right named function to hook to? How do you deal with maintenance? Uh, uh, so I didn't hear the, the, the first part, so sorry. <laughs> So he's asking, how do we, do we deal with maintenance? It, it's, it, <laughs> that's a nightmare. You, you said it correctly. That's a, that's a real nightmare. Because we are not, not all uh, helper fun help functions are a stable ABI. So this is, this is an issue. We didn't, actually, we didn't think about a possible solution. So if you have a solution, please, please tell me. Um, so yeah, the only, only, only choice is to use a stable ABI, stable, uh, so, so functions that will want, want to be modified, but I think there is no, no obvious solution here. If you get to the point where you have a stable API, what's the benefit of EBPF? <laughs> verifiability. So the, the, the point of EBPF is verifiability. So do you, do you trust some code sent, sent by someone else? That, that's the whole point. You can verify it, and then you can, you're free to, to load it or, or not. So why, why don't we use hypercalls? Well, we, we can use hypercalls, of course, but we, need, we have to modify the gas, the gas kernel. Right, so the, it's coming back to the confidential compute case. There's no way any guest that cares about security is going to blindly load. They're going to want to be able to attest to exactly what they're loading. So you're going to have to update something anyways every time you change your payload. Uh, 
not great, like people uh, that are, I mean, that's why you probably didn't understand anything of the conversation, <laughs> but uh, I will make things even worse. And, uh, Please. That, uh, uh, I think uh, you have to change the host kernel, like uh, to sometimes having a, a, a stable hyper-core API is, is problematic, and you have like to synchronize between the host and the guest, and basically I think this is punting the, the problem of the stable API to the Linux DBCS maintainer, which sooner or later will have to deal with this anyway. So uh, this is the thing that I like uh, in this is that I don't care about it and I just punt it to the Linux DBCS maintainer. The problem of the trace point stability has been there for years, and uh, in practice people are using always the same scripts and they just don't care that it's technically Of course, it needs a lot of verification on both sides. That's the point. Thank you. <laughs> so we're running out of time. If, if you have one last question. So I guess not. Thank you again for, for, for listening to, to me. And I will be around here for two more days. So if you have any questions, please feel free to, to ask. OK? Thank you.